Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. I have some positive news. After a bunch of procrastinating, I finally figured out what I want to do for my 100,000 subscriber video. Uh, it's not going to be that special, but I think it'll be fun, uh, so I'm looking forward to making that. It'll be very similar to the 10,000 subscriber one, so uh, for those of you who enjoyed that, uh, great. Um, today's video is not going to be too much from a technical perspective, um, but I'll update you guys on what I've been working on. Uh, I've been taking some time off work this past week, so I've had a lot of time to work on my personal project here and make a bunch of progress on the data harness, so let's cover what we've accomplished. Okay, so um, I don't know how much code I'm going to show this week because it's more so going to be a discussion. I did write a lot of code, but I don't think that much of it is going to be particularly interesting uh, for any of you guys to see uh, because a lot of it is testing. So. Last week's video, we kind of went through getting Spark to work, and we got Spark to work in the sense that we were able to combine results from Kafka, uh, from Yugabyte DB, so that we would have a Postgres compliant transactional database to use, and also Iceberg, which is really great. And that was actually working, uh, and it was working well for union tables. So a lot of the time that I spent this past week working on my project was doing a couple of things. First off, I wanted to take the Trino connector as it existed and move it into my current repository. I wanted to take um, my Spark connector as it existed and move it into the data harness repository uh, because, again, I keep saying this, my prerogative is to make it so that I have to make the minimum number of open source contributions possible uh, because I have found empirically that trying to make contributions to Trino or Spark really slows down my velocity. In the long term, that is the right thing to do, right? Like if I want to make a big style change, uh, eventually it's best that I make it in Trino itself or I you know, put my connector in Spark itself, which would be awesome. Uh, but the reality is that getting a bunch of people on board with putting in a bunch of code for something called the data harness that is really just like this random Gooners, you know, individual personal project is not gonna work that well. So <laughs> ultimately, uh, you know, I'm trying to keep things to myself for now. Uh, my eventual goal being to make some sort of social media posts about this data harness when it is a little bit more professionalized. Uh, get a bunch of people using it, and then if I am able to get people using it and really experimenting with it, then hopefully that would give me some more leeway to actually make commits to these open source projects in the future and get those expedited because they're actually users to this thing. So uh, with that being said, a couple of the things that I was able to cover this past week include you know, basically further uh, improving my testing. So now that I have uh, software to be able to read data harness tables from both Spark and Trino, I want to be able to write tests that ensure that that's actually working as I expect. And I'm able to do that. So uh, I have a test that basically spins up a bunch of Docker images uh, for everything that I need to test data harness. So I spin up a data harness server. I spin up a backing Postgres for data harness. I spin up um, you know, a Kafka instance with a schema registry and a Postgres instance, and also an iceberg table. And I populate all of those, and then I use data harness. Uh, and then I spin up a Spark Connect instance so that I can query Spark for my test and I spin up a Trino instance as well. And basically all of these things in conjunction allow me to ensure that my code works properly. Uh, so there's just a lot of work getting those Docker images set up, you know, kind of replacing the jars uh, as needed uh, with my local code so that you can kind of have a nice test-driven development uh, cycle there where as you're creating uh, new code, you can compile it to a different Java jar file, drop that into Spark, drop that into Trino, and then see your code actually running so you can see if your tests are passing or not. Um, so a lot of work there, right? Like. Uh, if I want to get people to use this thing, ultimately, there's a lot of shit that I have to do that uh, is maybe not necessarily what I want to be doing, um, but it's what I have to do in order to, to battle test this product a little bit more. So uh, doing that, as far as testing goes, like I said, um, you know, just moving the Spark and Trino connectors into the data harness repository itself so I can be checked into code. Um, in addition to that, building a really basic Helm chart. Uh, just so that if anyone wants to deploy this thing on Kubernetes, they can do so with uh, a very simple Postgres database and simple data harness server. In the future, I'll have to improve that Helm chart so that uh, you know there can be multiple replicas of the data harness server with a load balancer between them and uh, you know a Postgres in high availability mode. But for now, I'm not really too concerned about that. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the the bulk of what I actually accomplished. But uh, a lot of the work that I was doing also kind of involved trying to think about and theorize where this project could go on a longer term basis. So one talk that I happened to come across, which I'll link in the video description, I would recommend everyone, is for something called Mooncake. So uh, they were covering this on the Carnegie Mellon Advanced Databases channel, and I think that's just a really good series for distributed systems and data systems if you're into that type of thing. 
Uh, but long story short, this new company called Mooncake, I should say semi-new, they're about 13 months old, just got acquired by Databricks, probably for some you know ungodly amount of money. And what they do is they claim to be, as you can see from my screen, a real-time storage engine for Apache Iceberg. So what that really means in practice is they're taking all of the technologies that are kind of popular these days. So Kafka is still really popular for big data, pushing to a message broker. Uh, Postgres DB seems to have kind of won out as the popular choice for a transactional database. There's just a lot of development going on in that community. Uh, it's simple to use. Uh, people are using it a lot more than MySQL seemingly. So, uh, you know, they figure, okay, a lot of people are using Postgres for their normal database. It seems like Iceberg is also getting the lion's uh, share of uh, kind of lake house usage these days. Uh, despite Hootie and Delta Lake existing, it seems like Iceberg is where a lot of the ongoing development is going. Uh, Databricks purchased tabular, meaning that they're going to support Iceberg long term. So I think what this company basically did is say, all right, what are the technologies that everyone's really using these days? And how can we make it easier for people to use them in tandem? Because if you sync a bunch of application data into Postgres and you eventually want to run analytical queries on it, Postgres is not going to work too well for that. So instead, what they're doing is they're taking data from Postgres and they are syncing it to Iceberg, which in and of itself is not that hard, right? Like if this were a system design problem for me, I'd probably be like, oh, well, we should use change data capture on Postgres with Debezium and take the data off of a Kafka queue and then, you know, aggregate it to Parquet files and then, uh, you know, commit those to Iceberg. Um, that all works, but I think they found that in practice doing something like that uh, is not as low latency as they would like. And so instead, they've basically built this custom Rust process that reads data from Postgres and the transaction log and converts it to a bunch of arrow memories, uh, or sorry, arrow buffers in memory. So basically what we're doing here is, uh, let me look for it. We have this write aware table optimization. We have this managed buffer in cache. So they use local memory in NVMe, and what they basically do is they write write-ahead logs directly to the object store, use them on recovery, and they take streaming writes, and they put them in an arrow buffer. This is what I'm looking for. So the data is in Postgres. It gets buffered in Apache arrow format, which if you recall correctly is an in-memory columnar format. And then from there, it gets submitted into Postgres. But the nice thing that Mooncake offers as well is as long as you have those arrow, uh, that arrow data buffered and it hasn't yet been committed to Iceberg, the problem with that is that in theory it's not readable by Iceberg because it's not part of the Iceberg table yet. So another thing that Mooncake offers is they basically also extend Postgres DB to use um, an embedded DuckDB instance where DuckDB is basically just like um, an embeddable query engine. Think of it like SQLite but for columnar data. Uh, and DuckDB is able to both read the iceberg data and also read those arrow buffers and union them together. So in some senses, they've actually kind of built the data harness just very specifically for Postgres and iceberg, and they're really trying to keep it locally. So in my opinion, you know, this is a really interesting technology, uh, but it still does have some downsides. For one, uh, when you're buffering that arrow data, uh, again, it's only readable by like the Postgres DuckDB instance that Mooncake provides. It is not readable by any generalized distributed query engine like Spark or Trino or something like that. And that's what I'm trying to accomplish with Data Harness is to basically be able to build a generalizable table that can be hit by any single query engine, regardless of the implementation of every single data source format. So in theory, Mooncake could even you know extend themselves so that those arrow buffers are readable uh, through the kind of data harness metadata format, and then we'd be able to use Spark and Trino in order to read uh, Mooncake tables as well. Uh, but the point is, I kind of go on this whole rant because I'm basically just trying to say that it's very clear to me, looking at a lot of the technologies that have come up within the last, like, let's say, year and a half, uh, and have gained traction or gotten acquired or something like that, that a lot of them are centered around Postgres specifically and trying to make Postgres suitable for data analysis. Now, I also understood that up to this point, and that's why I put so much emphasis on trying to support either CockroachDB or YugabyteDB. The reason being that CockroachDB and YugabyteDB are Postgres wire compatible, so it wouldn't be that hard for someone to take their Postgres database and then switch it over to a CockroachDB or a YugabyteDB. In practice, I think I also have to recognize the fact, though, that it's not totally trivial. Not every tool clearly works. There are some nuances between all of them, and what I ultimately ask myself is, shit, I don't know how the data harness... God damn it, yet another ambulance. This is what happens when I'm back in New York. I mean, it also happens to me in Chicago, but same deal. Anyways, my point is, 
I understand that pretty much eventually the thing that I'm going to have to do here is support PostgreSQL. And it's hard to do that because Postgres, even though it uses MVCC under the hood, so like, uh, you know, it does keep old rows around for a little bit so that you can have like this concept of snapshot isolation. It is not the case that uh, you can just query from an arbitrary timestamp on Postgres. And that is what the data harness completely relies on because you need to be able to look at two different data stores at a particular preset timestamp so that you can transactionally move data between them and then update the data harness and update both of those timestamps for both of those data stores atomically. So you can't do that with vanilla Postgres. So I did a little bit of research. Uh, fortunately, ChatGPT is a little bit good at helping me with that and doing a bunch of web parsing. And long story short, there are actually some things that we can use to make Postgres more extensible for this type of workload. And the main one that I found is this particular extension here called Temporal Tables. So Temporal Tables has a thousand stars, which is not like a ton or anything, but it does make me realize that there are some people who actually use this, uh, and it is battle tested to some extent. So there's this one called Temporal Tables, which is implemented as you can see in C, and then um, there have been a lot of kind of extensions of Postgres recently. So like AWS Aurora, uh, I think Google Cloud, maybe AlloyDB or something like that. I can't remember. There are a bunch of different cloud Postgres databases that aren't actually Postgres under the hood. And so that extension won't work on them. So someone else remade the extension, albeit using only Postgres SQL and triggers. And by doing so, that means that this extension now works on all other derived Postgres types of databases, which is great. So you can see this one is only in PG SQL, which is really nice. But they both implement the same spec at the end of the day, which is that what you basically do is you have one table, right? You have your normal table that your application is uploading to, and you upload an additional column to it called system period. And it has some sort of timestamp range where when a row is created, it, uh, you know, the start of that range is the current timestamp. So the, the row, this timestamp range is representing the validity of the row. So it's currently valid. So the beginning of the range is right now. And then the end of the range is null. So it's unbounded. It's valid until it's deleted. And then we also have this second table that we create. So if our original table is called subscriptions, we create a second one called subscriptions history. And subscriptions history is just going to keep track of all older versions of rows. So for example, if I modify a row, the older version of it is going to be present in the subscriptions history table. If I delete a row, the older version of it is going to be present in the subscriptions history table. And what it's going to have in the subscriptions history table is it's also going to have that system period filled out with the start timestamp for when that row was created and the end timestamp for when it was modified so that it was no longer valid. And so what I can actually do now is I now can union the subscriptions table and the subscriptions history table together, and I can basically take a timestamp and figure out what the state of the database was at a particular time because I know what the valid rows were at that particular time. So let's say, uh, you know, I have test one right here. You can see it was inserted in August 1, 2017, and then it was modified, uh, you know, uh, five seconds later or something. If I have a timestamp that is outside of this range, I know that test one is no longer going to be valid, right? And so I won't include it in the results that I give back to the user. On the other hand, if the data harness is showing me a timestamp for the Postgres database that is within this range, then I need to include this row, which is awesome. Because basically what this has done is it has recreated snapshot reads in Postgres. And then the end user is welcome to clean that up as they need you know, because eventually this is going to accumulate a ton of state because we have to keep every historic version of each row. Eventually you can clean up those tables. Let's say, you know, the data harness user is like, all right, well, I'm only realistically going to need a day's worth of history. We can start running a cron job once per day that cleans up old rows in the history table. So that's basically the approach that I've actually gone ahead and implemented. And it is actually now working uh, in the data harness, which is awesome. So not only is it the case that I have Yugabyte DB working anymore, if I go to my readme.md, I added a section with a little bit of a chart right here, which shows which features we have working. So you can see now that in Spark, I actually have Postgres working as well, if you're willing to use the temporal tables extension. And so if you're willing to do that, I can make it so you can read this data in Spark, and you can also read this data from Trino. So now we can have all of these union views that combine from Kafka, from Postgres and from Iceberg. And so what you can basically have now is this, these very low latency data pipelines where we're reading data from all three of these sources at the same time and being able to basically see data from the moment that it gets published, which is really great. 
because what everyone keeps asking for is these hybrid transactional analytical processing tables where you can do this large scale analysis, but you can also have some data that just came in and you're still able to read that too. Now, the general point here is like, yes, Postgres and Kafka are not good to do data analysis on, but it's objectively the case that there's gonna be a lot less data to read from Kafka and also from Postgres. And so it's okay if our Spark query or our Trino query maybe pulls some data in from them too. Well guys, uh, that's pretty much the main update for the week. Um, I think what I may end up doing at some point is trying to make uh, a more formalized video on Mooncake because I explained it very informally here and I think it's harder for uh, people to understand. And also it would be just beneficial for me to really understand why that's so beneficial. I keep seeing, especially within the last like year or so, of these types of um, you know software companies that basically are doing change data capture from a row-oriented database to a column-oriented database, and they get acquired and they get popular. There's another one called PeerDB that was doing it between Postgres and ClickHouse, and uh, I find it very interesting. So uh, I do think these companies are maybe worth a video in and of themselves, and I'm happy to do that in a more traditional, you know, Jordan has no life PowerPoint format. Uh, but yeah, until then, this is kind of the, the update on Data Harness. We're getting very, very close uh, to the point where I feel like I can actually productionize some of this and try and make it accessible to the public. And when that happens, some people can maybe get their hands on it and give me some feedback. Uh, so until then, uh, feel free to leave a star in the GitHub repo. You'll just be doing me a favor. And uh, enjoy your weekend. Have a great new year. And I am look forward to seeing you all in the next one.